and welcome back to the Middling Along podcast. My guest today is Tate Smith. Tate is an award-winning trans activist, consultant and speaker, passionate about trans male visibility, educating others and debunking common myths surrounding trans people. His accolades include being named one of Attitude magazine's 10 LGBTQ plus trailblazers to watch out for in the future. And in 2022, he was selected as a LinkedIn top voice and nominated for Pink News Community Role Model. Via his social media channels, he debunks myths surrounding trans people, and via his consultancy work, he educates businesses on how to best implement and improve on LGBTQIA plus inclusive policies in the workplace. And he speaks on topics including the effects of testosterone, intersectionality, family and workplace acceptance, toxic masculinity, men's mental health, trans male menopause, male privilege, and more. Welcome to the podcast, Tate. Thank you for having me. That was a lovely intro. <laughs> I managed it without screwing up the uh, the kind of the word salad of, of the no, kind of the, the no, LGBTQIA plus, which yeah. is always always a mouthful, but really, really important to get right. So yeah. phew. <laughs> Before we talk a bit more about the work that you do now, are you okay sharing with us all a little bit about your sort of transitioning journey? How old were you when you first realised that you weren't necessarily comfortable living in that female presenting body? And, and what was that sort of process from that point to sort mm-hmm. of starting your, your transition? Well, I am just coming up to 25, um, born in 99. And I first realised that I was trans when I was 16. Um, I didn't have that language growing up. Mm. Um, I I kind of felt like something was was off with me during puberty, but I just thought that it was just puberty. I, you know, I wanted to be a pretty girl. I wanted to to look nice. I didn't know what was happening to my body. I grew up with a single dad. He didn't really have a clue what female puberty entailed. So I just kind of got along with it. And then sixteen, I yeah, I stumbled across a YouTube video of a trans man documenting his transition, and it all clicked into place for me. And I would love to be able to say, and then I began transitioning, <laughs> and the rest is history. Happily ever after. <laughs> yeah, that definitely was not the case for me. I came out to my friends and family. Friends at college were a hundred percent behind me. Family were not. They just couldn't see me as a man. They were throwing mm. comments at me about, you know, not playing football and, and playing with Barbies and just, you know, throwing gender stereotypes at me. So that lack of support uh, led me to going back into the closet for two years. And then I bravely <laughs> moved out of the family home. I got a new job to be able to privately medically transition. So through the private healthcare system. And then I began medically transitioning in April 2019. So I, I first realised I was trans at the age at the end of 2015 going into 2016 Mm -hmm. it was a very very long road for me but nevertheless best decision I ever made Uh, I had top surgery a procedure to masculinize my chest in August 2020 and yeah I've been taking testosterone ever since and it yeah it was the best decision I could have made for myself there's obviously a lot more eccentricities mm. and hardships that were contained within those years I spent within the closet. Um, but yeah, it, it hasn't been a smooth ride to get into the point of transitioning, but the actual transitioning has been smooth for me because now I get to see, you know, the aesthetic matching what was always in my brain. So you went through that process privately as opposed to kind of down uh, an NHS yes route which presumably would have taken a lot longer to to be able to do that a lot longer um when I originally referred myself in um 2018 when I thought okay I've got to start medically transitioning now now I'm 19 and I'd been in been in the closet they told me the waiting list was two to three years I'm still on the waiting list now it's January 2024 They're only seeing patients from the middle of 2018, which were originally referred. This is what I've heard through the grapevine, but they're seeing one patient a week. So the average waiting list Mm. to be seen, a first initial appointment by a gender identity clinic now is five to seven years. 
Um, I mean, wow. my quick maths isn't very good, but if that's one, me neither. <laughs> week, you're, you're looking at well, that's twenty years, isn't it? And that's taken into account more referrals. Last I heard from an activist friend of mine who did a freedom of information request back in May last year, there were eleven thousand people waiting to be seen by the London GIC Gender Identity mm. Clinic. So you wow. know, as trans people, we have to resort to forking out thousands of pounds, which I did um, in private healthcare to to go on testosterone. So it's it's a choice, but it, it kind of isn't because you know what you're getting into from hearing from friends in the community. So it's kind of like, okay, you 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 pop yourself on NHS waiting list for formality, mm. but you know you've got to pay thousands to, just to be yourself, which is disheartening, isn't it? Yeah, and and from from the little that I understand, I guess the you know the longer somebody is is in that kind of limbo period, you've got that gender dysphoria happening. How how much did it impact on you psychologically? That kind of waiting to kind of almost to like start your life as you mm. wanted it to be. Well, you've hit the nail on the head there because the waiting anyway, regardless of being on the waiting list, you know, those two years I spent in the closet. You know, it wasn't like I just went back into female mode. I knew I had gender dysphoria, which for people listening who might not be aware of it, is the mismatch that trans people have between our brain and our body where our gender identity and our sex assigned at birth doesn't align. So in my instance, my sex assigned at birth was female and obviously that didn't align with how I was feeling. So I get feelings of gender dysphoria, extreme discomfort in my body that's what makes us trans rather than someone who's cisgender and their sex perfectly aligns with their gender identity. But yeah, I, I couldn't stand the waiting and I had to take basically precautions to save lots and lots of money and get myself into a job where I could afford the private healthcare costs. And it's not easy, you know, not every trans person is fortunate enough Mm. to earn that amount of money or go into a corporate role like I did. Um, So it really does take a a physical toll on you as well as mental, you know, especially if you don't have support from your home life and then financial as well. It's a huge burden. But like you say, it's that it's that waiting to start your life, you know just constantly looking at yourself in the mirror every day, trying to make yourself look more manly, you know, in my instance, and um, trying to pass, trying to pass in everyday life as a man. And then when you get misgendered, mm. even though you, you're you obviously going to get misgendered because you haven't started taking testosterone and you don't look that manly yet, you know, and it just hurts you deep. Um, so it's a it's a battle every single day. Um, but once you you get seen and oh you you meet with someone who deals with trans <laughs> people, it's the best feeling ever. Yeah, you just feel see, seen and heard rather than being an admin problem or a number on a waiting list. Mm, that weight kind of lifting. Yeah, metaphorically and literally, yeah. And so you obviously also started taking testosterone. So the the reason I guess that, that you're here is is that you do talk about the link between that and accelerating you into basically what is menopause. Mm. Um, were you going into that process? Did they prepare you for what to expect? Did you kind of go into that sort of eyes wide open? I had no idea to answer. Um, quickly Um, I had no idea that menopause was going to happen to me as a result of taking testosterone Um, when I was given a consent form at my gender identity clinic it you know it gave me a long bullet list of things that would happen to me that were very reminiscent of male puberty so broad shoulders sweating increased hunger anger irritability Mm. adult apple growing things like that the other sort of effects I discussed with other trans male friends of mine who were transitioning so through word of mouth I got to know the little niche things that would happen to me like being more hot having nightmares for the first three weeks I mean it's actually something which is not unheard of within the trans male community it's just that it's not spoken about Mm. so if I had known that I might be going through the menopause and discussed that with my friends maybe I would have been given a heads up but unfortunately I don't think there was enough (laughs) 
people either presenting themselves research or understanding um, into trans masculine patients going through mm. the menopause that kind of um, following people up once they after they've gone yes through the process what happens in the private healthcare system is is ideally once you've reached the end of your second puberty five six years you will have eventually been seen by the nhs so it's over to them now for them to right. monitor you and do your blood tests etc so perhaps maybe that's where it's getting lost and and then also there's there's no studies into trans patients going through the menopause i mean you might be aware of this all the medical studies seem to focus on you know cisgender white women so it's not even just trans people who are left out of this vital research it's people of color it's ethnic groups it's marginalized communities um so no it wasn't something i was aware of but it came as a really really big surprise to me a year later and have you spoken to other people in sort of similar situation to you so does it does it the kind of the outcome vary quite a lot depending on whether or not you have opted to have the sort of the bottom surgery yes good way of putting it and I, and I actually I'm trying to make a, more of a point of saying this that you know even if I I didn't go on testosterone I would still be going through the menopause anyway because I was assigned female at birth but I have obviously chosen not to have lower surgery so that's why I have the symptoms but the symptoms are a result of me taking testosterone and then on top of that, a very, very strong form of testosterone, so nibido. So I get 1,000 milligrams injected in me every 10 or 12 weeks, depending on where my blood levels are at, because sometimes I need to space it out. But yeah, once I started taking that nibido, the symptoms came on really, really strong. So the first thing that I noticed was uh, vaginal dryness, feeling like I constantly needed to to go for a wee. I was giving loads of urine samples to the GP and all of them were coming back negative for a UTI. So I just presumed it was testosterone just changing my mm. body. And then um, after six months of every single appointment, you can imagine like an ultra scan on my ovaries, a smear test, a sexual health screening, being asked if I'm pregnant. I mean, they threw the kitchen mm. sink at me. But they, they, didn't, they didn't have any... <laughs> clue that it could actually have been menopause no exactly they um they said we we don't know what to do so i then booked an appointment with my endocrinologist at my private healthcare gender identity clinic and as soon as i told her the symptoms she said oh yeah those are symptoms of vaginal atrophy it's a major symptom of the menopause and i thought oh thanks <laughs> <laughs> now <laughs> you tell me exactly that's that's just what i needed to hear so <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm currently working with NHS studies and researchers at the moment to hopefully help GPs with that practical guidance and recognizing those symptoms, you know, as soon as they're presented. Because I really would have loved to have gone to the GP and been told exactly what I was experiencing, rather than off oh, just drink more water. I mean, if you feel like you have a UTI, that's not a good thing to say anyway. Um, but I was just constantly being like told, I don't know what this is. You need to go to your clinic. We don't know what to do with you. And it's just then, a huge gap in, in understanding. and Well, that knowledge. exactly. But then on top of that, the rude and invasive comments that come with it, such as how do you have sex? Is it something that you're doing? Perhaps you have a STI that you weren't aware of for a number of years. Are you sure you're not pregnant despite you taking a thousand milligrams of testosterone? I mean, the things they were mm. saying to me were just... Yeah, really strange. I'm going to jump ahead to one of the questions that I put about finding good healthcare providers mm -hmm. as a trans person. I mean, it sounds as though the, it's actually quite difficult to find a GP that, that mm -hmm. is kind of well versed in terms of providing that mm -hmm. good healthcare. How do you kind of navigate that? How have you managed or have you managed to sort of find individual GPs and healthcare practitioners? It's a very good question. And I think people who aren't in the community really underestimate the stress that the GPs bring on us trans people because the roles are reversed. When you go to a GP, you look for advice, you look for guidance on, on why you're feeling the way that you do. 
when you're trans and you enter a doctor's practice, you Im immediately become a terminology trainer, an educator, that half an hour, if you're lucky, in that room basically turns into a lunch and learn or an open Q&A session and you end up educating mm, them. Your curiosity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's not a nice dynamic to be in. And the quickest way I could answer this is by saying probably what many people are aware of. It really is a postcode lottery. It really is the luck of the draw. I've been very fortunate that... Uh, I've moved quite a bit around Essex and then I moved into London. So I've had quite a few fair GPs. Um, the most recent ones have been very, very supportive. The first one was a very interesting experience because, you know, when I first presented myself, and I think this speaks a lot to male privilege. I mean, I knew this presenting female. Every time I presented something to the GP, it was always, oh, are you sure? Are you sure? oh, this is just what girls go through. Oh, this is just puberty. This is this, this is that. You know, you're constantly invalidated. Then what I found was as soon as I began presenting male and I went to my GP and I said, by the way, I have a shared care agreement. I'm on a waiting list, but I've been diagnosed with gender dysphoria by a private gender specialist and they've prescribed me testosterone. What I need you to do is do a shared care agreement so I can get it on the NHS and then you monitor me until I get on the NHS clinics books and then I won't need to see the the clinic anymore but don't worry about it because I'm paying them so it's it's no extra effort for you what I found was that GPs are in constant competition with private doctors so when I was presenting these shared care agreements I was getting a lot of con confused looks back and what I found was that I had to really really fight to get to get my my rightful health care and um, as soon as my voice started deepening and I started challenging and it was always male GPs for some reason they started listening to me mm, and I thought that was that was really really interesting and that was sort of like the first because I remember like really getting into an argument with this male GP who was the partner of the practice so should have known better and as I went uh, to get up and go to the door you went don't worry mate I'll sort it for you I thought, wow. <laughs> like I'm in a Guy Ritchie film, not the GP, but yeah. Like, so, so that got sorted. I got my testosterone in the end. But yeah, and I, I, if there are trans people listening in, I would just advise you probably will have to fight your GPs. Don't feel like you need to come out in every single situation. Please protect your, your well-being and your mental health. You know, try not to escalate it or get into any arguments, but also have a level of empathy because especially if they're newly qualified general practitioners, they might not be aware. They don't get the training that they mm. should. Gender dysphoria is not covered as much as, you know, other things they need to learn. Um, but equally, I think that GPs need to be doing their own research in their own time, like take it as continuous professional development, because a lot of trans people, both adults and young people are presenting themselves to GPs right now. We touched upon, upon the fact that you sort of very rapidly experiencing a bunch of menopausal symptoms mm -hmm. so you are able to take uh, localized estrogen vaginal estrogen to, to kind of alleviate some of those things and that doesn't have any kind of impact no. from the point of view of interfering with that testosterone and no. and that was one of the first questions I asked is it gonna reverse my transition she said my endocrinologist no it's such a low dose um, it will not impact you in that way the only way that it will impact you is actually by relieving the symptoms within the lower region which it does you know, it's not like if I apply loads of it, which sometimes I have to, it's going to turn me back into a woman. Um, but yeah, luckily, estrogen cream doesn't, you know, affect my transition or my testosterone levels at all. Mm, but presumably, it could be something that you would have to keep taking lifelong in order to kind of I believe, stay comfortable yeah. and kind of... Yeah. yeah, if I don't take it for a couple of days, um, I apply it about every two to three days as maintenance. The symptoms do do flare up. So I do think it is something I'll, I'll have to take for the, for the rest of my life. But that's fine with me because I'm mm. not quite sure what, what the other alternative is, just sit in discomfort. Yeah. 
it's a kind of small small <laughs> price to pay so thinking about because obviously you do a lot of work with uh with workplaces with different organizations as well as sort of campaigning and advocating more more broadly thinking about menopause writ large we're seeing a lot more companies you know really taking that seriously maybe offering menopause policies guidelines benefits what kind of things do you advise on in terms of being more inclusive and not just thinking about that kind of cis female experience well you can first start with all your posters and your marketing and your comms if there are people from corporate spaces listening a lot of the the stuff i see just is just images of of white elderly women and uh, as as you have covered on your podcast before you know it doesn't just affect that group you know it can happen any younger to cis women and it doesn't just impact white people and it doesn't just impact cisgender women which is obviously why i'm speaking today and obviously there will be non-binary people and gender non-conforming people who go through the menopause as well so that would be a good place to start Um, updating your inclusive language in conversations and your policies so stop saying menopausal women say menopausal women and trans people or and trans men going through the menopause you know it doesn't mean to say that you need to eradicate the word women It's just that we want to make sure we're inclusive of everyone. So if you find it quite a mouthful, just say people going through the menopause Mm. or menopausal people. It's it's really not that difficult. Um, I was on a panel recently where I found that people got quite worried by my presence and kept, bless them, trying to use the language and and messing up by going women no and and (laughs) oh and just just say menopausal people keep it simple or women and trans men whatever works for you in conversation but we want to make sure that we're being inclusive of everyone and also if there are trans people out in your workplace and reading those policies they're going to want to know that one they're going through that and two you see them going through that you need to call it out so that you can support because you'll need to inform your private medical um, health insurer if you've got that as part of your benefits packages to make sure that when someone requests you know hormone replacement therapy a cream or whatever they're not Mm. going oh well we've never had a trans man ask for this before we've only ever prescribed it to women um let let me check with my supervisor you know you don't want to be saying Mm. things like these and also just um communicating this to line managers and and support teams you know whatever is appropriate for your workplace so that they can recognize these symptoms and go, oh, are you going through this? I won't ask you anymore. I don't want to be invasive. But if you want to have a conversation about this, I'm, I'm happy to. Or I can signpost you to somebody who's got lived experience. Or I can signpost you to say this podcast and other resources. You know, there's, there's plenty that you can be doing. And even before somebody presents themselves to you as being a trans person going through the menopause, you know, we've seen quite a lot in the media around sort of transphobia. What are some of the ways in which we can can sort of ourselves be better trans allies? Um, I think I know that you've got some really good suggestions on um, on your social media, which I'll, I'll kind of share some links to some of the resources that you mentioned in terms of understanding some of that terminology being a kind of a good place to start. A good proportion of us may never have knowingly come across a trans person in our everyday life before Mm -hmm. and that's completely fine but what you want to do is you want to best educate yourself so that when that situation presents itself you don't shut down or freeze or panic so if you're starting at the most basic level I don't know anything about trans people just give it a google my first recommendation would be to learn terminology so take yourself to stonewall um, list of lgbtq plus terms learn the basics there then go on to we create space queer allyship lexicon which has 360 inclusive terms so larger than the stonewall glossary 
but it has language that trans people use, such as passing, transitioning, and that will really, really help you in conversation with a trans person, because what will happen is once you're equipped with that language, you won't be scared to use it and you won't be scared to hear it. And then you can use it to best educate people. So you can say, hang, hang on, you just misgendered them. You know that's not okay. You know they use these pronouns. And then you can be on the road to becoming a really good ally. And then there's lots of other things you could be doing. You could watch Disclosure on Netflix, which is a film which explores trans representation in media and film. You oh, can not watch... heard of that one. Thank you. It's really... <laughs> yeah, definitely give it a watch tonight. There's TED Talks. There's plenty of videos. If you typed in transgender, transgender man, transgender woman, if you don't understand anything about what it means to be non-binary or mm-hmm. gender non-conforming, look at LinkedIn creators like me. Look at people on Instagram. Just take that time you may use doom scrolling and, and put it into learning yeah. because your mind will will just open up so much and you will learn so much just by listening to trans people because a big part of my work as you mentioned in the intro is debunking those myths and we've touched upon a big one today with the gps and obviously their menopause which is such a taboo but i don't think people realize that you know just how well one exciting but then also how difficult and how how layered you know our lived experiences are it's not just you know, identifying as helicopters and changing your name and infiltrating single sex spaces and trying to brainwash kids and all of this horrible stuff we're hearing in right wing newspapers, which I would advise yeah. nobody read at the moment. Um, you know, it's it's taking that narrative back. Um, and there's plenty of good and wholesome content out there. And I mean, I don't obviously want to, you know, just market myself here, but you know, if it, if that's what it takes, I'm a good place to start. You know, I have been speaking and advocating for a number of years now. Um, I think also it will give you a really good insight into the trans male lived experience because us trans men, unfortunately, do not get enough visibility. So there might be people listening in who go, okay, yeah, I understand, okay, male to female female to male or it might be the other way around so you know you've got london transgender clinic you've got gender gp you've got gender hormone clinic these are the gender identity clinics we we transition in privately those will give you the breakdowns of what transitioning looks like what hormone does um and and i think that will really really open your eyes um so yeah it's there's a lot more out there than you think that would be my advice to people and again there's been a sort of a certain amount of controversy around sort of younger people young young adults children even and uh, expressing sort of that wish to to transition so what are the ways that if somebody has a sort of young person in their life and they're, they're sort of expressing the kind of intent that to support them I would say don't be don't be fearful. Please don't play into the anti-trans rhetoric we're seeing in the press. Life is not over if your child comes out as trans. And if they do come out to you, I would take that as a massive compliment because that is a really big thing to reveal to your parent or your carer. So say thank you and then have a sit down with them, you know, make a nice drink get a snack, make it a calm and supporting environment and just say, you know what, do you want to, do you want to talk through this? And then let them open up to you because it's one transition doesn't look the same, regardless of if you're an adult or a young person. And it might be that they're gender questioning or they are more fluid in their identity, or perhaps they want to present differently at school or or maybe a different way at home, or they want to try out a new name or new pronouns. You've really got to be led by them. And if you're going, okay, Tate, well, well, that sounds all great. I know I'm supportive. I'm happy to have the chat, but then what do I do when I go to school? How do I how do I approach the school? How do I tell the parents in the playground? We're seeing a lot of horrible guidance, which I must stress is not uh, statutory. It's mm. not. It's actually unlawful. Trans children must be gendered correctly and use the bathroom of their choice whilst at school. 
This goes for young people and for adults. The guidance which you may have seen in the news where it says otherwise is just guidance. And us activists are rallying so that, you know, when this consultation goes to Parliament, our views will be heard because it's just so unjust. That aside, there is plenty of support with um, schools, deed polls, talking to parents, going to support groups where you can meet other parents of trans people. And you can find those through the charities Mermaids, which is very well known. But I would also mm -hmm. like to signpost you to another charity who I volunteer with, which is Gendered Intelligence, who are fantastic. Both charities do support groups for a range of age groups. The ones I volunteer with at Gendered Intelligence is the under 12s. And it's an opportunity for your child to just go and be around other trans children and just be a kid. It's so sweet. They just play games. They engage with the youth workers. They do arts and crafts. There's space for them if they need to talk about something they've seen or maybe something difficult they're going through at school. And there's also space for parents and carers to talk with a professional as well. So it's a really, really supportive environment. And then both charities offer residential camps, one-on-one -on -one support, helplines. Um, so they would be a really, really great tool for you because I, I can't possibly answer what it would be like from the parent perspective because unfortunately I didn't actually have that support mm. from my family. It would have been a game changer for you to sort oh. of have those, those kind of charities around. Oh, I'll and... tell you seriously so that's why I signpost them now because dare I say it is probably a better time now in terms of support to come out as a trans young person than it was years and years ago. I mean, take that from somebody who didn't even know that transitioning was possible until they were 16. Really? Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I, I feel like <laughs> I've learned a, a, a huge amount. Um, I, hope, you know, I hope everyone listening has too. And in terms of the menopause space, it is great that we're having more and more of these conversations that we're kind of broadening out that kind of spectrum of of lived experiences that, that we're talking so openly about and, and, that, and you're a huge part of that so thank you no thank you and thank you for giving me this platform I really appreciate it you've been listening to the middling along podcast do remember to subscribe to be notified when our next episode is live and why not visit the blog at www.middlingalong.com to sign up to my newsletter as well I do hope you enjoyed listening today. If you did, I'd be really grateful if you would consider leaving a short review as that helps people find the podcast and helps get it noticed. Hope you can join us next time. Goodbye for now.